Are you a warrior? Maybe you're easily stressed. Are you quickly negative? What about kind of pessimistic? Are you somewhat of a doomsdayer? Well, guess what? You don't have to be. Fear doesn't have to win all the time. Face it with us. Let's learn how to deal with it all. Living fearless. We're going to pray over this tonight. I don't know what the catchy sermon title would be other than sometimes you got to look back. Amen? So we'll go with that. How's that? Let's pray. Father, I'm asking you right now to be glorified in everything that's said and done. I'm asking you to change people's lives as we unlock the word tonight. But most of all, Lord, let you get the glory for it all in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. 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 Several years ago, there was a a sociology study that took 50 individuals that were older than the age of 95, and they asked them this one question. If you could do anything over in your life, what would it be? And although the answers were absolutely all over the place, they really came down to three basic categories, three basic categories. Number one, they said that we, we would take more risk. If we're given the life again, we would take more risk. Number two, they said if we could do it over again, we would reflect more. We would reflect more into our life. Number three, they said, given the chance to do it all over again, we would do more things that outlive our life. We would do more things that outlive our life. And in our life, I can't think of anything quite as scary as getting to the end of your life and looking back and seeing that your life could quite possibly be meaningless. And while we hope that's not the case, it is a possibility. And so tonight, we're going to take just a brief look at what happens when you look back and how to conquer that fear. I don't think my mom really ever stood a chance when it came to us boys. There's four of us, and many of you know this story. Uh, There are four of us boys, and, and laughably, I'm probably the smallest of them all. I called her up one day, and I asked her, can you just describe what it was like living with four boys? And so this is what she said. She she gave me these things. I had to to dig into an old message. I got to dig these out. But but she said, this is what you ate and drank over a one-week time, four of us boys. Every day, every day, y'all drank at least one gallon of milk one gallon of tea, and went through one loaf of bread every single day growing up. Every week, you went through a dozen eggs, 15 pounds of potatoes, three pounds of peanut butter, and several, several jars of jelly. At the beginning of the week, she would buy one giant bag of cereal, and it was for breakfast for one day. The rest of the day, the rest of the week, we ate either pancakes, oatmeal, or eggs. You had to do something that would stretch out in such a big family. My, my mom's family would raise a pig and a cow. And then every year, they would slaughter that pig and cow, and then we would eat on that meat all year long. That's all we ate. She joked when she was telling me this, she said, we had never tasted store-bought meat until we were teenagers. 
And she said, when we first put it in our mouth, she said, we immediately spit it out and said, that's spoiled. Each summer, we would pick tons of vegetables, and then we would can for hours on end. Anybody know what it's like to lay out a sheet and just have peas more than you could ever see? I remember shelling those peas from early in the morning to late at night, and and, and does anybody remember how your thumb felt at the end of that? You know, it would be purple and swollen and sore. We picked our own pickles, and we made our own sauerkraut out of cabbage. We even froze our strawberries so that we could have dessert throughout the year. So from that, maybe you can get the idea of the size of us boys. We were big. We really were. And fight, well, we did that constantly, absolutely. Waking up every single morning was a risk for me. I don't know if you realize it or not, but my feet would hit the ground and I would make a beeline for the table because you knew you couldn't fight at the table. And it was a fight constantly. Somebody, I would come around the corner as fast as I could, and my dad tells the story about legs that would magically come from around the corner, and I would just topple head over ends. And y'all, y'all saw the picture. Can y'all picture those arms and legs tied up like a spider? It was just over and over and over again. My brother closest to me and I had a fight one time. And we're arguing back and forth. And so uh, I had locked him out of the house, but much to my demise, he had taken one item out of the house. And I had decided I was going to go play at the creek, and I had opened the door and didn't see him and made a run for it. And then all of a sudden, sharp pain came across my chest, and I froze. My brother had taken an old bull whip that we had, and he had went straight right across my chest, and I I mean, it left a wet forever across my chest, just took all the air out of me, and man, I started crying and yelling and screaming and the whole nine yards, and here's what I did. Now, now some of you, I, I am not, I am not, I am not condoning revenge. I am not. You hear me? Look to your neighbor and say, revenge is for the Lord. This is just an example. That's all it is. So I get on my bike, and I start pedaling as hard as I can, and I go down to the drugstore. It's Patterson's Pharmacy. I go down to Patterson's Pharmacy, and I grab a bottle of cinnamon oil. Now, I don't know if y'all know what cinnamon oil is. In the 80s, there was a fad of taking toothpicks and soaking them in cinnamon oil, and then you'd put them in your mouth, and that, you'd chew on them, especially us rednecks. We would, we would sit there, and we would chew on them. On a, but the cinnamon oil is, is very caustic. And so in, the, in, in my mind, I had the perfect plan. And I, I go back into the house, and I go in there, and Mark, Mark is in there getting ready for a date. He's ready to smooch up on his honey, and he's got the whole nine yards, and he's been in the shower, and he's getting out. And man, he's all that. And I sneak in the bathroom, and I take some of that cinnamon oil, and I pour it in his aftershave. Oh. Have you ever seen the movie Home Alone? He hit his face with that aftershave, and the next three hours was in the ER. I took a risk. I took a risk. I was a hero to my friends. I stood up against the Gestapo. I wasn't going to be bullied around anymore. And when these old people look back in their life, they say it wasn't the success or the failures that they had. It was the sheer excitement and the joy when they took more risk. And they said, if I had to do it back again, man, I wish I would have taken more risk. I don't know if you realize this or not, but following Jesus is quite possibly the riskiest business and choice of all. 
It really is because, because to follow Jesus is not just to say, I believe. Although modern Christianity might water it down and say it's just about saying a sinner's prayer, we're told over and over again in the Gospels that the deeds follow the faith. And that if the deeds are not following the faith, you better check the faith. Following Jesus is risky. It'll get you in trouble. I love the story uh, uh, of, of Charles Blondin. Charles Blondin was a tightrope walker, and he decided that he was going to walk across Niagara Falls one day. He was going to do it across the tightrope, and in 1859, he came up from the Canadian side, and he crossed all the way over. Crowds were there, and they were screaming his name over and over again, Blondin, Blondin, Blondin. As he came in, he finally got to the platform, and he stopped, and he looked down, and everybody cheered, oh, there he is, there he is. And he looked down, and he said, what do y'all think? They said, do it again. And he looked down there. He said, do you believe I can do it? They said, will you can do it? Do you know I can do it? You can do it. Will you go with me? And the crowd fell silent. (laughs) They said he could do it. They believed he could do it. But they weren't willing to walk with him. We believe in Jesus, but too often our lives were not willing to walk with him. Too often in our life, our life is all lip service and not walking through. There was one man in that crowd. His name was Harry Caldwell, Harry Caldwell. And and he stepped up. I'm not believing that because I just read this somewhere. I think he was probably pushed. And he said, I'll go. I'll go. I believe you enough that I will risk everything. And the question I would ask you tonight, do you believe in Jesus enough to risk everything in your life? Do you believe in Jesus enough to take the greatest risk of all and believe in Jesus tonight? Believe him enough to walk with him, to talk with him. Harry climbed up on Blondin's shoulders, and the wind began to blow side to side to side. Harry Caldwell later on reported that when when they got to the middle, the tightrope started shaking. The wind started blowing, and Blondin screamed up at him at the top of his lung, and he said, Harry, you're not Harry anymore. I need you to be blondin. When I take a step, I need you to take a step. When I lean one direction, I need you to lean one direction. When I make a move, I need you to make a move. Every step I take, I need you to take that same step with me. You do this or we both die. And my question tonight is, are you willing to risk so much in your life that you're willing to look at Jesus Christ and say, I will move when you say move. I will walk when you say walk. I will talk when you say talk. And if not, I will die trying. Are you willing to take a risk? Church, I believe that this is what it means to be a Christian in today's language. It's not just enough for us to be talking it. We have to be walking it. We must be an extension of Jesus Christ himself. Every move he makes, we had better be making it with him. And these old people said, if I had it to do over again, I would risk more. I would risk more. The second thing that they said is they said, if I had this to do over again, I would reflect more. I would reflect more. I'm reminded of an interview that Dan Rather had with Mother Teresa back in the 1980s. And I I, I began to dig and dig and dig and look for this interview. And I I found this. And I'm just going to, rather than play it, I just want you to listen to the transcript of this. Dan Rather looked at her and he said, Mother Teresa, when you pray... 
what do you say to God? And she looked at him with all the seriousness that only she could, and she said, I don't say anything. I just sit and I listen. And thinking that he had this perfect follow-up question for Mother Teresa, thinking that, that he had her nailed dead to rights, he looks at her and with all honesty, he says, well then, what does God say to you? And she smiles. She looks at him and says, he doesn't say anything. He sits there and he listens. Then as the pause just to get more and more pregnant, she looks at him and says, if you don't understand this, I won't be able to explain anything else. Church, I believe that there is a kind of prayer where you sit and say nothing at all. You ask nothing, you just simply surrender your life to Christ. And you sit there. You invite him to come in. And like Jesus told and prayed in John, you beg him to be in you. To be so immersed in every piece of you. Your words. To be in your actions. To be in your deeds, that every single portion of you drips with the Holy Spirit's presence. Church, I believe that we have lost the art of prayer. I really sincerely believe this. We list off our demands one by one by one by one by one. Lord, give me this. Lord, give me that. Heal this person. Do this. Do that. We're always ordering God around. Go back in your own prayers. You don't believe me? Get honest with yourself. Do your prayers look like just a, a litany of constant requests? Or maybe your prayers are like this. Maybe your prayers are this secret telephone line where you're catching God up on the latest gossip. It's almost like we believe that God is sitting there with a notebook and he's sitting there and he's writing down, oh, really? I didn't know Sister Jones was in the hospital. What room is she in? You probably know Isaiah 40, 41. It's, it's a memory verse. If you, you don't know, you need to know. But those that wait upon the Lord... They shall renew their strength. They shall mount up like wings, like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and shall not faint. But I have a question. Have you ever looked at the very next verse after that? Because I think 41.1 hits it on the head when it just simply says this, and in the silence and in the quietude, he will come to you. When's the last time that your prayer was just a time of reflection? It wasn't full of requests. When was the last time your prayer was a matter of just sitting with God? No requests, no ideas, no suggestions to God, just listening. The people said, if I had to do it over again, they would reflect more. We need risk takers. There's no doubt about that. We need to reflect more. But the last thing that they said was this. They said, given the opportunity to do it all over again, we would do more things that live on long after us. They would have some type of legacy to it. What is your legacy tonight? If you were to die right now, would it really make a difference in five years? What does your legacy look like? When, when you finally get laid in the ground, what will they say about you? 
It's a fair question. And don't act like it's not going to happen because when you die, everyone's going to talk. The question is, how long are they going to talk? They're going to talk for five minutes, five hours, five days, or five years. How long is your legacy? Someone asked me a question this week. And I got to admit, it, it, um, it sort of got to me. It really, really did. The question was this. Why don't we spend so much money on outreach? Why don't we spend so much money and in, in, in give a, giving away stuff? And I just looked at him and I said, what do, you want, what do you want me to spend it on? When we get together, when, when, when the pastors get together, when the elders get together, what do you want me to tell them to spend it on? And they said, well, you know what? We need, we need women's toilets. We've got, a, we got women's toilets, but, but they keep stopping up. We need, we need new ones. And, and, and we have a sign out there. And that sign, man, it would be so much better if we just get a flashy new sign that's on there. And, and, and you know what? We, we really need to do something with our landscaping. We, we, we've got landscaping out here. We have this, but, but we really need something else. And, and we've got some sheds back here, but it sure would be nice to have something else. We have this. We we have this, but it'd be nicer to have this. And, and, and church, here's what I came up with in my head. And, and granted, I'm a simple redneck, okay? Here's the answer. When I prayed about it, here's the answer that I got. The answer was in the question. We have. And God's saying others don't. We have. When God is saying others don't. It's about reflecting more so that we know God's directing. And it's about risking more. So we're stepping out of our comfort zones. And it's about investing more into those that don't have. You want to know what our call is at the end of our life when we look back? Those are the three things. We've got to get out of our comfort zone, church. We've got to spend time reflecting with God so we know exactly what he's asking for. And then we've got to be able to put what, our, what we have out to, for those who don't have any more. And we've got to be willing to do that. Well, that's the intro. Let me read you the scripture. I'm in Matthew 25, if you want to mark your Bible. Jesus is, this is the last real soliloquy we see in Matthew recorded. And Jesus, this, this 20, 23, 24, and 25 is just all red letter. If you had a red letter edition, it's just, little, just like a, a, a big pen just bled all over the place. Jesus is going through and he's going all this stuff and he's talking about all these things. He's going on and on and on and on and he gets to this and he sums the whole thing up. Beginning with verse 31, I want you to listen very closely to this, very, very closely. But when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit upon his glorious throne. All the nations are going to be gathered in his presence, and he will separate the people as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep over on his right hand and he'll place the goats over towards the left. Then the king will say this, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty, and then you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me into your home. I was naked, you gave me clothes, and I was sick. Oh, I was sick. I was so sick, and yet you cared for me. And when I was in prison, you came to visit me. The righteous ones, they will reply. Those are the ones over here. They'll reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and we feed you? 
or thirsty and give you something to drink? Or we, when did we ever see that you were a stranger and show you some hospitality or naked and give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in prison or even visit you? He said this. And the king will say, I will tell you the truth. When you did this to the least of these, you'll be doing it to me. Charles Finney, a great, great revivalist from the Second Awakening. He's known for many, many, many things. Among them, things that we use to study the word very deeply, systematic theology, his view of Arminianism. But really what pushes me towards Finney is this, is his altar call. His altar, altar call is totally different than we do it today. Finney used his altar call not as a personal time of reflection. It wasn't a time to come down here and sit down on one knee and be all proper and, and, and just sit there and everybody can see me and I'm spending my time. I'm not saying that's bad. I'm just not, I'm just not sure that that's all there is to an altar call. Because I look here, and he says that he used his altar calls as an enlistment to this new abolitionist-type movement, this movement where people are set free. He would stand in the pulpit, and he would scream at the top of his lungs. He would say, if you have been set free in the name of Jesus Christ, now I ask you, now enlist to set others free. Finney knew that it wasn't enough to believe. Your belief had to push you into action. Your belief in Jesus Christ must propel you to do something. I believe that that's why James penned those words that said, faith without works is dead. It's this understanding that if you're not creating a legacy with your life, if you're not reproducing, if you're not making more disciples, if you're not pushing the gospel out to more people, if you're not spreading the gospel in a very real and tangible way, then really you have found nothing in your life. Church, here's my call to action. I believe, I believe that Church on the Rock stand poised at this very minute to make a difference in this community like no other. I believe that it is our day and our responsibility to stand up in Jackson County and make a difference, to recognize our role in this community I believe that it is our responsibility, our biblical duty, to see the hungry and to feed them. I believe that it is our moral and spiritual obligation to search out those who are disenfranchised and serve them and pull them into the body of Christ. I believe that we are commissioned to search for the unchurched, the unsaved, and the unconnected and bring them into a family of God such as ours. I believe that it is our job to find everyone who is hurting and to pray for healing and to use our touch for nothing but good. I believe it is our commission tonight to look back on our life where we stand, no matter in this great spectrum, and to learn to risk more in our life, to take the time to reflect more over what God would have us do, and lastly, to create bigger and better things that will outlive us all, and do this all for the glory of God. Amen. Again, we are incredibly glad that you joined us here today at Church on the Rock. 
encourage you to go to the website. There you can find any of our archive podcasts. You can send us an email about how God's working in your life or a prayer request. Or you can give to our ministries financially by clicking the giving button at the top right-hand corner of the screen. Have a blessed day.